and I told you on Wednesday I wouldn't keep office hours yesterday because I had a hospital procedure. I had a heart ablation. I don't know if you've heard about that, but my heart has been experiencing a mild flutter, not serious. But in order to see to it that it didn't get serious, I had this procedure done. According to the doctor, who's supposed to be the best surgical cardiologist in town, after following this procedure, I'll not ever have this problem again. Let's go for it. And so, at quarter to 11 today, I was still in North Florida Regional Hospital. <laughs> so it's been a little hectic getting over here on time. And I finally finished signing the discharge papers and all that stuff, and here I am. I'm not quite up to par. I feel a little feeble. But I'd much rather be here than any place else. So we shall proceed. I expect I'll go more slowly than usual. If I have to jump out of the class for a moment, don't worry, I'll be back. Now then, in thinking about exam one, which is booked for Wednesday of next week, Wednesday is just not a good day. So I'm gonna to try to get exam one changed at least to Thursday of next week, which is a far better day. We don't have chemistry class on Thursday for starters. And it doesn't cause the problem of trying to accommodate people with Wednesday night laboratory during the day with exam one on Wednesday. Because we have a class now. So that would interfere to a certain extent with that scheduling. Stay tuned. You will, of course, be reminded, and I hope in an absolute fashion, when I see you on Monday of week coming. And when I see you on Monday of week coming, I will announce what has to be done for those of you who have Wednesday evening laboratory, or a different class, whatever it might be, or instead Thursday evening laboratory. No worry, everybody will be accommodated. Now, back to our 1.0 liter solution of 1.0 molar hypothetical Bronsted acid HZ. For which we stipulate the ionization extent is 95%. That's a large extent. Pretty close to 100%. <clears throat> And 1.0 molar is a fairly concentrated solution. <clears throat> Question is, if 8Z was a real acid and we wanted to put it on our acid base table, would we position the formula for 8Z above hydronium ion because it's a stronger acid than hydronium ion? Or would we instead recognize that even though with this ionization extent, 8Z is categorically as we have defined acid strengths, a weak acid and its position in the acid base table would be underneath hydronium ion. Let's take a look at this and then to the extent that's reasonable, we'll talk about material balance considerations that relate to this. Note From a material balance standpoint, how can 8Z be viewed? It can be viewed as a combination of moles of 8Z and Z minus, which is true. But it can be, be viewed as straight 8Z, one mole thereof, because this is a one liter solution, or straight Z minus. And if we view it as straight Z minus, 
then we can wrestle with the question, how will Z minus compete with the base water? Because those are the only two bases in this system of consequence. Z minus and water. As proton grabbers. How many protons are available for grabbing in this solution? One point zero moles. Supplied by 8Z. <clears throat> Sure, there's a tiny concentration of hydronium ion, but we're not going to pay attention to that. We're only going to concern ourselves with the hydronium ion molarity that's developed by the chemistry of 8Z, which allows us to get at Ka for 8Z, and which allows us to determine where does 8Z appear in our acid base table, above or below hydronium ion. So we'll write this reaction equation. By definition, what does this correspond to? Because this reaction equation is representing the chemistry which occurs in this solution with solute 8C. By definition, what's this reaction correspond to? Well, maybe I'll make it more clear by saying after this reaction occurs, then this condition is established. What does this equilibrium reaction correspond to? What is it? Ka for what? Yeah, Ka for 8C. Remember that's our measure of strength for an acid? So let's get Ka for 8C. From the information supplied, we can evaluate each of these equilibrium molarities. <clears throat> 1.0 moles total of 8Z is what we imagine to begin with. But most of the 8Z goes away, doesn't it? 95% of it goes away. So after this equilibrium is established in this solution, what's hydronium ion concentration? Z minus concentration? <clears throat> Remaining concentration of 8Z? <coughs> now, roughly, in the original solution, before we consider this reaction, how many moles of water? How many moles of water? We're imagining that we have a 1.0 liter volume solution. Water's the solvent. And before this reaction occurs, we got 1.0 moles of 8Z swimming around in this solution. Did you look at the information that I offered you on the PSI handout? for convenience. We'll take a mole of 8Z or Z minus, I don't care, to have a volume that's the same as a mole of water. Just for convenience. I mean 8Z is hypothetical, so who cares? That won't be too far off if we pick any binary monoprotic Bronsted acid, like HCl. Now, this couldn't be HCl, because HCl ionizes 100%. So, back to calling it 8Z. <coughs> How many moles of water in the pot before this reaction occurs? Roughly. About 54 moles? Yeah. Because the mole of 8Z occupies a volume equal to that of one mole of water. 
So if you've got a liter, most of it's water. And if it was all water, it'd be about 55 moles of water, wouldn't it? 55.3 if we take it to three sig figs. Liter of water liquid, pure water liquid, 55.3 moles. Well, this is not pure water liquid. Got a mole of 8Z dissolved in it. So we got about 54 moles of water. How much of the water is chewed up by this chemistry? <laughs> Roughly. 0.95. Well, let's call it a mole. Fair enough? About a mole of water is used up by this chemistry. So the equilibrium quantity of water is how much? About 53. These are all moles or molar concentrations because we got this liter volume. Moles or M, or molar concentration. All right, now let's put the data in and get Ka8Z. <clears throat> if we do this arithmetic, if my memory's right, We get 19. You can check it if you've got a pocket calculator. I'm still a little fuzzy here, so. <clears throat> 18? 18. Well, let's just take 18. That's good enough. Because we've only got two sig figs in the data which we are using. Okay? 18. So now we know where 8Z fits in the bronze laurier acid base table, don't we? That's a big K value, but it's not as big as Ka4 hydronium ion, which is 55.3. So guess what? Even though 8Z has ionized to an extent of 95% at a high initial molarity, one molar, it's still a weak acid, which we determined by this computation. So what have we discovered? What we have discovered from a material balance standpoint is that if we view this system as 54 moles of water, because that's what we started with before the chemistry occurs, okay, and one mole of Z minus and one mole of available proton because all the available protons are coming from this. Nothing fancy about that. Initially, the ratio of moles of base water to moles of base Z minus, if we treat the original 1.0 moles of HC as instead 1.0 moles of Z minus and 1.0 moles of H plus. So initially, moles water outnumbers moles A Z minus by how much? 54 to 1. Right? Isn't that what we said? Initially, before this reaction occurs, we'll write it down. We'll call this star so I don't have to write again this e equation. Before star occurs, can consider system to be composed of 54 moles water one point zero moles e minus And 1.0 moles available H plus. Just for fun. If we treat the system like this, 
Do you think the mole of available H plus occupies any volume of consequence? Do you think a mole of protons occupies a volume of consequence? No, why not? Why is it very small? What is H plus? It's a hydrogen nucleus, isn't it? What's the size of a nucleus compared to the atom itself? You did this in 2045. Practically speaking, nothing, right? The volume of an atom is almost 100% bigger than the volume of its nucleus. It's about 99.9%. .9%. You did this in 2045, didn't you? Good. So we're not messing things up from a volume G whiz standpoint. Now then, tell me, this is a story that's just for fun. If you and I were initially, I'm treating you as one individual, okay? If you and I are candy bar thieves, we're bad kids. Bad kids have a habit of stealing candy bars. Sometimes. <laughs> if you and I are bad kids, and there's a candy bar warehouse right next door, and we break into the candy bar warehouse, one of you, one of me, and we're equally, equally clever at stealing candy bars. Okay? After we leave the warehouse with no kinetic considerations, okay? We're equally clever, clever at stealing candy bars. One of you, one of me. What will be the ratio of candy bars you have to the candy bars I have? One to one. One to one. That's not difficult, is it? Okay. Now then, if there's 54 of you and one of me, and we're equally clever at stealing candy bars. What will be the ratio of candy bars you have to those which I have when we leave the candy bar warehouse? 54 to 1. 54 to 1. Now you've got to bear in mind, this is a difficult part of this, this story which I haven't worked out yet. And right now I'm too foggy to work it out. My apologies. When Z minus steals H plus, as opposed to a bad kid stealing a candy bar. Because when a bad kid steals a candy bar, you still got the bad kid now in possession of a candy bar, right? But when Z minus steals H plus, is it still Z minus? No. no. Now it's 8Z. It changed its nature. Whereas in the other case, we just got a bad kid with a candy bar. Okay? But look what happened to the ratio. of water molecules to Z minus after the candy bar thievery took place. We won't consider at this moment the fine detail that Z minus consuming H plus loses its nature as Z minus. Well, pardon me, pardon me, I said that wrong. We have to consider the fact that Z minus, when it steals H plus, is no longer Z minus, it's HZ. And when water steals H plus, what does water become? Hydronimine, okay? So, 54 to 1 was the initial ratio of this base to this base as we have described the system. But after the stealing took place, we got 0.95 moles of these and 0.05 moles of these. So after the stealing has taken place, what's the ratio of hydronium ion to Z? Not difficult, you divide 0.95 by 0.05. That gives you the 19. That's why I miswrote 19 there before. Okay? This tells us 
Who was better at stealing H plus? Let's go back to the candy bar warehouse. 54 are you, one of me, okay? After we steal candy bars, there's 54 of you and one of me, but you're better than me. When we leave the candy bar warehouse, how will the ratio of candy bars you have to those which I have compare to 54 to 1? Be bigger than 54 to 1. Aha! But I shan't be outdone by you. So instead, 54 of you go to the warehouse, one of me goes to the warehouse, but I'm better than you at stealing candy bars. So how will the ratio of candy bars you have to those which I have compared to 54 to 1 now when we leave the candy bar warehouse? Smaller. Be smaller than 54 to 1. Is 19 to 1 smaller than the initial ratio we had? Absolutely. What this is telling us, this G whiz analysis is telling us that Z minus is a stronger base than water. It outcompetes water for H plus, just like I outcompeted you for candy bars when I took the role of Z minus. Okay? Well, we know from conjugate theory, don't we? If Z minus is a stronger base than water, then in our base column for acid base table, here's water, and underneath it someplace is Z minus. Well, what does conjugate theory then tell us about the relative strengths of acid hydronium ion to acid 8Z, since acid hydronium ion is derived from a weaker base? Well, that means acid hydronium ion has got to be a stronger acid than the acid which results when Z minus grabs H plus. That's the way our acid base table, table reads, doesn't it? As the acids get stronger in the acid column, from bottom to top, the bases are getting stronger in the, base, in the base column from top to bottom, as they must. The stronger a conjugate base, the weaker is the corresponding conjugate acid and vice versa. Weaker conjugate base, stronger conjugate acid. That's all this amounts to, no more, no less. All right, we'll go back to stuff like that when it's appropriate in the future. Now let's get on with some more practical stuff. Oh. Let's raise the slate here. We're now on page 1823 in the notes. Question, how do we get Ka and Kb values? Well, on occasion I've had a wise guy or a wise girl student say to me, I look them up in the table. <laughs> Somebody had to make this table sooner or later somewhere along the line. Somebody had to get the information that goes in the table. Somebody had to evaluate these KAs. And that's done strictly and exclusively by experiment. That's what science amounts to. The only thing we take for fact in science class is that which can be verified by experiment and result. That's it. I can stay in here all day long and tell you that H pluses weigh two pounds a piece. <laughs> it's not going to make it true. I could write a fancy story, call it a theory, which says H pluses, based on my theory, weigh two pounds a piece. That does not make it true. So if I am a reasonable scientist and I've offered this bogus theory, I have to change the theory because H pluses ain't going to change how much they weigh because of what I said. Matter? Atoms, ions, molecules don't give a damn what we say or what we think or what we calculate or what we theorize. They never have and they never will. But as chemists, it's our job to do what we can to understand these critters of sorts, these chemistry critters of sorts. Because that's what chemistry depends on. That's what our very life depends on. We are walking systems of chemistry. And if that chemistry is followed up, that's why I went and got the heart ablation. <laughs> and we know that bad things can happen. And I don't know if I mentioned this before, maybe I did. I think it's very interesting. 
Remember the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? What Heisenberg uncertainty principle tell us? Did the Heisenberg uncertainty principle stipulate that no matter what we do investigationally, that means by experiment, we'll never be able to know exactly what an electron is. In a nutshell, that's what Heisenberg's principle says. So here we are, with all this brilliancy and modern day technology and theories and all that kind of stuff, and that little tiny electron, essentially a massless particle with a charge of minus one, is going to forever outfox us no matter what we do if Heisenberg's statement is correct. And I have a feeling that Heisenberg's statement is right on the money. Because there's nothing we can do experimentally without disturbing the nature of the electron. So how can we know what the heck this thing really is if every time we try to observe it, we disturb it? We got a problem. Electron one, smart chemist, zero. Ha, ha, ha. All right, practical stuff. Let's imagine way back when we're starting to do chemistry. And we'll also imagine we have the gadgetry available to pursue these investigations. We wish to determine the acid strength of acetic acid because it is a reasonable argument that acetic acid is the best known acid of all time. Because way back in pre-biblical days, people were doing chemistry which made acetic acid. Now the chemistry they were doing was called fermentation. You heard of that, I bet. It isn't acetic acid they were trying to make. They wanted to make the potable stuff. But the way it was done back then, it was inescapable and unavoidable that they also made acetic acid. That accounts for why acetic acid is arguably the best known acid of all time. So let's imagine that we're an ancient chemist. Okay? But we try fermentation, that gives us the acetic acid. And somehow, some way, we managed to get ourselves a good working pH meter. I don't know where we got the electricity to power it, but who cares? That's the fabled part of the story. So we carefully prepare some acetic acid solution of three sig figs, 0 0.300 molar, and we measure the pH with our pH meter, and the pH meter reads the two sig figs, just like the pH meters you have for your use in 46 laboratory. And we get the number 2.63. And now I recognize that this number, which is a log, shows me how many significant figures. How many sig figs for this? How many? Let's have a vote. This is a log. The question is, in the log 2.63, how many significant figures are there? Put your hand up if you vote for three. No looking around except me. If there's any cheating going on, it'll be done by me. After all, I already proved I'm a better candy bar swiper. <laughs> how many vote for two? And how many didn't vote? I'll let you keep the Tennessee tickets. But I expect that you'll learn a lot from loss. Say, you learn a lot more from losing than you do from winning every time. That relates to why you learn a hell of a lot more in a tough real chemistry course than you do in some Mickey Mouse activity where you walk through it, make A's, and didn't learn a damn thing. I am not running any class like that. Never have, never will. Because that's an insult to the educational process, and it's an educational travesty. It's a violation of why you're here. You're here to learn. And you're not going to learn in a class like that. All right, remember, log composed of two parts. The digital entries before the decimal point, to the left of the decimal point, called characteristic. All they do is locate decimal point. That's a power of 10 multiplier. But the significant figures, including zeros, are all shown by the digital entries past the decimal point, right side of the decimal point, in a log, called the mantissa part. So, two sig figs. 
That's why I wrote this concentration of two sig figs. So with this, we want to calculate Ka. So we write this reaction equation. The reaction equation tells us that in this solution, I only got one solute. The solute is acetic acid. So all the acetate ion that I produce has to be derived by this reaction. The only source of acetate ion in here is acetic acid losing H+. And the only hydronium ion molarity of consequence will be that produced by this reaction. I mean, after all, in pure water, we only get a hydronium ion molarity production of 1.0 times 10 to minus 7. We already learned that. And if I take a water system and acidify it, Le Chatelier, if I acidify a water system, like I did here, because I put acetic acid in water, okay, what do I do to the ability of water to react with water to make hydronium ion? Do I increase that ability, not affect that ability, or make that ability get poorer? What do you got to say about that, Le Chatelier? Water plus water makes hydronium ion hydroxide. That's the reaction equation which accounts for water producing hydronium ion by reaction with water, right? Now I put in an external source of hydronium ion, haven't I? Which way do I drive this water plus water reaction? Toward water. So whatever is the contribution to hydronium ion concentration in this solution, it's a good deal less than 1.0 times 10 to minus 7. And if I add 1.0 times 10 to minus 7 to this number, do I change this number? Heck no! So I also know for this solution, the only source of hydronium ion is acetic acid. Like it's the only source of acetic ion. Okay? And what we're talking about, that's the understanding the chemistry part. Because if you understand the chemistry part of this puzzle, you can always do the arithmetic. And that's what I want. I want the understanding part to be there. Okay, so we write the Ka expression, we put in the numbers. Here are the numbers. We have to recognize from a material balance standpoint, at equilibrium, we have written as a decimal fraction 0 0.0023 moles per liter of acetate ion. And the molarity of acetic acid initially is 0 0.300. That's M sub I. That's the label on the bottle. But what is the true molarity of acetic acid in this solution? This isn't this. That's the label on the bottle. That label tells you what the stock folks did or what you did if you were this ancient chemist to make the solution. For every liter of solution that you prepare using water as the solvent, you dissolve 0 0.300 moles of acetic acid. You're not going to have 0 .0, 0 0.300 moles of acetic acid in the solution after you prepare it. And I mean instantly after you prepare it, because H plus transfer, which is what every brown Lowry acid base reaction is, occurs in a fraction of time that's smaller than a nanosecond. Will you accept me, my saying that's instantaneous? Okay. So this gives us our equilibrium molarity of acetic acid. What is it? Tell me the equilibrium molarity of acetic acid. Do this arithmetic right now. Zero point two nine eight. Zero point two nine eight. Okay. So I'm taking this square, dividing it by zero point two nine eight, and I of course will get the value which you see tabulated. Acetic acid has been studied so much that I've never seen any value for the ionization constant, acid ionization constant, reported for acetic acid except this value. So I take this as a reliable value. Because many different investigators have got to come up with the same value. Now then, let's take a jump from this calculation that we did for acetic acid. Let's take a jump and make a very important generalization which applies to single solute systems like this. The only solute in this system is acetic acid. That's the only stuff we dissolved. Point. 
in such a system, the hydronium ion molarity, which we've just found, is the same as the molarity of the conjugate base, isn't it? And if we represent those molarities with X, since I think we're most at ease using X to represent the great unknown, then the equilibrium molarity of the ionizing solute will be M sub I, the label on the bottle, SX. That's what we did over there. So, we get this generalization for an acid solution. It's acid ionization constant, so long as that acid is the only solute in the system. The only solute in the system which has any effect on pH. X squared over M sub I minus X, and for a base solution having the same properties, or the ionizing base, pardon me, is the only solute in the system that affects pH. X squared over M sub I minus X. Now let's use this. 10th molar acetic acid. Before we do any calculation, however, I want to ask a question. You know me, I'm full of questions. See, your job is to supply the answer. For the 0 .300 molar acetic acid solution, <clears throat> this is the hydronium ion concentration. The two significant figures, this acetic acid solution is produced by taking this acetic acetic acid solution and doing what to it? Diluting it by a factor of three, right? If you wanted to make that solution, you could take a quantity of this, dilute it by a factor of three, and it'd be that. Nothing fancy about that. You've done this stuff in lab. You've done this stuff in lab this term. Tell me. If we can convert the acetic acid M sub I concentration for this solution to that solution by dividing this by three, can we convert this hydronium ion concentration to the hydronium ion concentration for that solution by dividing this by three? Is that fair? If I divide this number by three, will I get the hydronium ion concentration for this 10th molar acetic acid solution? Yes or no? Yes or no, Le Chatelier? And the answer is, hell no! Because when you take this equilibrium system and add water to it, that's what you do when you dilute, isn't it? You take this equilibrium system and add water to it. What do you do to the degree or extent of ionization of acetic acid? You increase it. So before we do any arithmetic, we know the hydronium ion concentration for that solution is bigger than this number divided by three. All right? Now let's get at the arithmetic. We'll use this generalization we just came upon. The only difference being that in this, for this calculation in the denominator we got 0 0.10 minus x. <clears throat> now then, what do we do to solve this? Is this a quadratic equation? It is a quadratic equation. Shall we solve it with the quadratic formula? No. Don't you dare, not in here. Because if you do that, you'll get the answer and you will not have understood the chemistry that goes on with the system. And that's what's wrong with taking information and shoving it into a formula. So, let's take a look further at this quadratic expression and recognize. We'll put it down as a note. If M sub I minus x is equal to or about equal to m sub i. Which means x is such a small number when you subtract x from this you don't change this. Then we can solve this without treating it as a quadratic. 
All we have to do is to take the m sub i value, multiply it by ka, and extract the square root of that number. So we'll write, if Well, let's put it this way to make sure you know. If it is true that 0 0.10 minus x is equal to or about equal to 0 0.10, because that's the solution we're dealing with, then 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 times 0 0.10 equals x squared. All right, now let's do the arithmetic and then see if the arithmetic which we have done is correct. All right, so x is equal to the square root of 1.8 times 10 to minus 6. What's square root of 1.8? The two sig figs, what is the square root of 1.8? Or you want to do the easy part first. What's square root of 10 to minus 6? What is it? 10 to the minus 3. Okay? Would you believe me if I told you that the square root of 1.8 lies between 1 and 2? The 1 squared is 1 and 2 squared is 4. So is the square root of 1.8 closer to 1 or 2? 1. Okay. Did you do squares of numbers in high school? I hope so. What's 12 squared? 144. What's 13 squared? 169. What's 14 squared? 196. So we know we got the square root of 1.8 in between what two values that we just cited? 1.3 and 1.4. It's in there someplace. Okay? Which is correct. 13 squared, 169, which will give us 1.7 relative to 1.8. Or 14 squared, which is 196. Or 1.96. Which value is closer? 1.3. Is this an approximation? I've seen textbooks refer to this as an approximation. Is this an approximation? How many significant figures may we have in this result? We only know the solution concentration of two sig figs. We only know the Ka value of the two sig figs. We cannot possibly compute the hydronium ion molarity beyond two sig figs. So this is no approximation. And textbook tells you that is baloney. That's the answer based on what we've done. Now let's see if it's the correct answer. How do we see if it's the correct answer? Here's what we did, didn't we? Hmm. All right, let's write. 0 0.10 plus 0 0.0013. I'm gonna write my 1.3 times 10 to minus three as a decimal fraction. If I subtract this number from this number, what do I get? What do I get? What do I get? I get 0 0.10. That's what I get. <laughs> you learned about significant figures, didn't you? This value is known to the hundredths place. 
So after I do the subtraction, I must round to the hundreds place. I can't operate on this and make it a value knowable beyond the hundreds place. <laughs> no, I can't do that. That's cheating. So when I subtract this from this, I get 0 0.10. Done. Okay? Now then. Let's lay foundation for this calculation. And as necessary, we'll finish it next time. Unless we finish it now. A lot more dilute this solution, isn't it? And we have recognized that as we make the solution progressively more dilute, we up the ionization extent of the ionizing solute, correct? Bingo. So my question to you is, to calculate the hydronium ion concentration for this solution, for which we shall use our generalization, Do you think it is legitimate for this solution to believe that m sub i minus x is about the same as m sub i? And the answer is, hell no. Because for this solution, which is exceptionally dilute, that acetic acid is going to ionize to a large extent, isn't it? So, we'll finish this calculation next time. You can do it now, but I'm going to show you the best way to do it. It is a quadratic. If we have to solve the quadratic, but we shall not solve it with any quadratic recipe. It will interfere with our knowledge of chemistry development. We don't want that. And then we'll talk about ionization extent itself from a recipe standpoint. <laughs>